At the beginning of the last century, these ships were the link between California and the rest of the world. The Thayer brought lumber to San Francisco to rebuild the city after the 1906 earthquake and fire. The Balclutha brought grain from California around Cape Horn to England and to Europe. These sailing ships were the only connection between California and the world economy. Today, a hundred years later, a billion people are globally interconnected, creating new markets, creating new opportunities. Sun is a proud sponsor of the Davos World Economic Forum. Here, we're learning to see through each other's eyes. We're creating a new global vision. The new Gemini telescope, high atop Hawaii's Mauna Kea volcano, brings remote galaxies into view. Scientists around the world are remotely looking through the telescope, studying the stars to understand our origins here on Earth. Not far from the shore on the island of Hawaii, scientists are working to unlock the riddles of the universe. To see how our knowledge of the stars is expanding, we've come to the deepest mountain on Earth, Mauna Kea, rising 17,000 meters from the seafloor to the summit. Here at the summit, the world's largest collection of telescopes surveys the stars. These telescopes are linked by network to the world of scientific observers remotely distributed around the globe. Our digital journey is thus taking us from the stars to the top of this mountain out to the rest of the Earth. Digital Journey's John Gage began the day here at Halipuhaku, a living compound for the scientists who operate the telescopes. Located at 9,000 feet, it's where they come to catch their breath. From here, the expedition sets off for the mountaintop. John Gage has come to Mauna Kea to see the role of networking technologies in the Gemini project, a multinational effort to build twin 8.1-meter astronomical telescopes. Gemini 1 is here. With its twin, in Chile, it will provide complete unobstructed coverage of both northern and southern skies. Telescope technology has come a long way since Galileo. The optics themselves can bend and flex and keep themselves in alignment. And so like sort of modern aircraft, um, each one of these systems, the secondary mirror, the primary mirror, the telescope drives, the enclosure that the telescope sits in, the actual mount, all are controlled by independent computers. They're all talking to each other all the time. Computer control allows the mirrors to shape as the atmospheric distortions of the light change. It makes the image sharper. And that image is transmitted from here by network to astronomers around the world. Eventually, we'd like to operate the telescope over the internet. The advantages are that you don't have to travel to Hawaii, which may sound like a disadvantage, but if you don't have the money to it, it means in the past you simply couldn't do your science. It also means that different people all over the world can collaborate in real time. So it really is a partnership between the technology of telescopes, the partnership of the networking, and people's imagination. That sort of triangle, if you like, of technology, networking, and imagination will actually be looking at the universe in a decade, in 10, 20 years' time, saying, wow. Connections are transforming countries and cultures. China, the world's largest country, is reforming itself. China is recreating China. Students at this advanced high school in Shanghai are dedicated to excellence in every field. Despite their Spartan dormitory life, they have unlimited expectations, and they are devoted to building a new China. Well, 
we studied our country's history, we're always proud of the four inventions, literary, accomplishment, arts, cultures. I remember a dramatic letdown when we were studying histories. We realized that Ch Chinese culture as a nation, as a country, never experienced industrial development. Today, students study post-industrial technology. High schoolers are learning to write computer programming like BASIC and Java. It took 10 years for PC to really took off in China, but only took internet six months, uh, one year, to really be broadly accepted. It seems like people can talk more directly and equally on the internet, and you can talk to almost anyone. As the students of this graduating class from prestigious Fudan University pack their bedrolls to leave for the last time, they enter a world where the only certainty is technological change. Don Shi has come to Fudan to recruit students for his software company. We go out actively to different provinces to talk to different universities, to colleges, to the graduates and introduce them the future of web. And from there, we hire the individuals who are qualified and most importantly, have the motivation to learn the technology. In order to develop, Chinese policy is to rebuild the institutional sinews of the state. Everything from the banking, legal, and delivery systems must be brought into the 21st century. There are infrastructures being constructed in China which make it exciting to participate in the early stage. Don Shi's company, Halcyon, is poised to develop the software that's needed. One of the difficulty of e-commerce is the standardization of different technology. So that's the vision that we have in terms of participating in e-commerce to use Java as the foundation. Halcyon now employs 80 young engineers at its facility in Guangdong in southern China. Soon there will be 200. For these young Chinese, it's like a postgraduate school. Their pay is low by Silicon Valley standards, but the future is bright. All they have to do is focus on learning, focus on gaining the technology they need in order to participate in the development cycle. Over the last millennium, China resisted foreign technologies. Now, these young engineers are creating the software that will enable their country to evolve into the digital future. Is the digital future a human future? After all, everything human is analog. How can artists, musicians, creators use technology to build new forms of culture? From the human voice to percussion, woodwind, and brass instruments, mankind developed music, a universal language that transcends cultural boundaries. The invention of recording devices allowed performances to be preserved and distributed, leading to the creation of whole new industries. Now digital media, distributed on the internet, creates the opportunity for interactive forms of expression. The music and the web overlapped is in some ways the most powerful language of all because music is so universal, it's so tribal. And if you take a medium that's so global like the web, there's the power of entertaining and communicating on a capacity and scale that I don't think has ever been imagined before. But the internet has growing pains. Some say the web today is like a silent movie. It took a while really before the filmmaker's art became extended to a point where they could use dialogue and sound effects and music as a part of the overall experience. And if you try and watch television with the sound turned down, you'll probably fall asleep. So it's only logical that the web, which is possibly the most exciting of all of these media, should have sound absolutely as a core component. She blinded me! Thomas Dolby rocked to fame in the early 1980s with the MTV hit, She Blinded Me With Science. A musician and innovator, his groundbreaking work explored creative ways to merge music with computer technology. The motivation that really gets me up in the morning is to make a cultural impact. I'm really, I think, elevating the platform for interactive music. Cognitive studies show that in interactive communications you need three things, color, interactivity, and sound. People remember the song that they heard when they got married the first time they kissed. 
even though we assume we remember things better visually. Audio is very, very lasting. Now Dolby wants to sonify the web. His company, Beatnik.com, is among those developing the interactive audio capabilities of the internet. Sonification will permit a new generation of composers and multimedia designers to score, mix, and distribute music over the web. The nice thing about Beatnik is that the way it sounds to you, the musician, when you're creating it in your studio, is exactly the way it's going to sound to any user anywhere on the net, regardless of their modem speed. It's very interesting to imagine what the next generation of musicians are going to be doing with this technology. The web is bringing people together as a community. It's like a whole new way of expressing yourself, and it's so exciting being able to mix songs in real time. You can turn anybody onto that. The power of the web and this new language of interactive communications is we're going to recognize the genius of many people who couldn't fit society's format for ideas, because people can communicate in ways they couldn't before. Imagine the next millennium. Then imagine the next 10 millennia. For computer scientist Danny Hillis and author Stuart Brand, the future is a long now. In a society driven by the accelerating pace of technological change, the short-term profit motive of the market economy, and the next election preoccupation of politicians, some say we have become too short-sighted. I went from trying to build supercomputers and, and making things that were really the fastest machines in the world to feeling that everything I was concentrating on was getting faster, 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 and I needed a part of my life to step back and concentrate on slower for a while. I think we have a sense these days that not just technology is accelerating, history is accelerating. We're so busy keeping up with the present that I think we lose track of the long-term issues of the future. This is a story about time and responsibility, and a project designed to encourage people to think beyond the psychological barrier of the millennium and into the future. The clock of the long now is both a myth and a mechanism. One great thing about a clock is that it doesn't accelerate. One hour is exactly the same as the next. That's kind of reassuring. And clocks are familiar tools. They've been giving order to civilization since the 14th century. But where most clocks are about minutes and hours, this clock is about centuries and millennia. The clock of the long now is intended to last 10,000 years. It will keep time on a vastly expanded scale. The clock ticks once a day, the bongs once a year, and the cuckoo comes out on the millennium. Danny Hillis has devised the mechanical design of the clock. I'm used to designing things out of electronics, so that would have been the easiest, but there's no way electronics could last 10,000 years. Its works consist of an ingenious binary mechanical system that has precision equal to one day in 20,000 years. It self-corrects by phase-locking to the noon sun. In some sense, it's the largest mechanical computer that was ever built, certainly the slowest. The clock is intended to be an engineering artifact that inspires awe and fascination on the scale of Stonehenge. From its site in the Nevada desert, the device will help us appreciate the world's slow rhythms of change. This clock is meant to be big enough so you can wander through it. You can climb up through the mechanical works to its display, where you see 10,000 years of centuries to come. And the clock should be inside a mountain, so when you come out, you literally have the long view like a living time capsule. The clock's construction will educate the future about us. The pendulum is designed to swing in one second or half second increments, so future archeologists can deduce our fundamental unit of time. And the facility will contain a library housing cultural and environmental data of lasting importance, footprints left behind us in the sand. Long-term responsibility preserves options for the future, maintains an underlying basis of long-term continuity and stability. So we feel safe to explore and invent as wildly as we want. Responsibility gives the future tools to help itself. Understanding the connections of the past, understanding the connections of the present, help us to create the connections of the future. It's up to us here at Davos to assume responsibility for the future we're creating. I'm John Gage. 
Thanks for watching.